So it's a pleasure being here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, what the Mike is, uh, Alex forgot to say is that uh, at Berkeley we were roommates, so yeah. he had a great influence on me. So. <laughs> In any event, so today I'm going to talk about testing families of distributions, and this is joint work with uh, Jayadev Acharya, who's here, okay, and uh, G. Kamath, who's my student. So Jayadev is a postdoc at MIT, and he's on the job market this year. So he's a great, really, really good guy. So if you're hiring in this area, he's a great guy to consider. In any event, so uh, maybe every talk in. Uh, uh, hmm. Okay, I guess. Uh, maybe the other one you projected. Sorry? Click on, the click on the slides once through the. So maybe the attention is somewhere. I actually have no. I don't see my PowerPoint here, so. Okay. Sorry about that. What? You don't see what? I don't see my PowerPoint on my screen. Ah. So let me try my clicker. Ah. Try to click, just click a button first and see if that happens. That's the problem. So this is not a click. It's not a click here. It's just the attention. The pro it's uh, you're focused on a different window, I think. Oh, oh really? I think so. So it's not a click problem. Can you use the keyboard and change slides? No. Okay, so it's not a click problem. Okay, now you can. Anyway, so maybe every talk in epidemiology starts with uh, this figure, which the pig. Still doesn't work, sir. No, this works. Yeah. Which the pigs uh, cholera cases in uh, Soho in London. Uh, so there was an outbreak in uh, 50, 1854 uh, where about 500 people died in 10 days. Uh, so the uh, dominant theory about what was causing this at the time was that uh, it was a polluted air in London. So uh, physician John Snow actually identified uh, uh, a pump, a water pump, as the cause of the disease. So this map shows cases of cholera and the water pumps in Soho. And uh, sort of like, uh, so this, so John Snow realized that uh, sort of like cases are concentrated around this pump, so they, they, he identified the cause of the disease. And that, that's a founding event in the science of epidemiology. So if we wanted to formulate this, uh, identifying the cause of the disease as a statistical uh, learning or testing problem, one natural formulation is the following. We're observing points on the plane, okay, these are cholera cases. And uh, our model or hypothesis, right, is that there is a single source of the disease, and as you move away from the source, the probability you get the disease is smaller, right? So now you're observing a bunch of uh, points, a bunch of realized cases, and you want to figure out whether uh, these samples are consistent with the hypothesis that uh, there is a single source of the disease, and the, the distribution of the cases is unimodal around that source. Okay, so in some sense, this problem is really a problem about testing unimodality of distributions. So, with this motivation, the problem I want to study today is the following. So, I have sample access to some distribution P. All right, it's unknown. I have sample access to it, and I have a set of models or hypotheses. Right, and my goal is to you know, get a bunch of samples from the distribution and decide whether the unknown distribution belongs in the class of models I'm interested in, or it's far from being in the class, under some distance. So in the previous example, the, the set, the class C of models are unimodal distributions. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm observing, you know, cholera cases and I want to decide whether they're consistent uh, with being sampled from a unimodal distribution centered around that's the source of the disease. Uh, other classes of distributions I'm going to consider are log concave distributions uh, and, you know, I'm going to give a bunch of other, uh, you know, classes uh, later in the talk. All right, so that's, that's the high level problem, that's the problem I want to solve. Okay. And I'm interested in characterizing the sample and time complexity to solve this problem. Questions about this high-level goal? 
Okay. So if something if something is far from a unimodal distribution, if epsilon far, I mean you have to ask the distance. I have to define the distance, yeah. Yeah, but just intuitively, yeah. think of a mountain as right. a unimodular unimodal distribution, and I'm thinking of a mountain with a little little peak here. Right. That's not a unimodal distribution. It is not. Right. But but I guess your point is that this is not epsilon far from the mountain. Yeah. If a mountain, if a little mountain is very small, yeah. it's not gonna. It's actually this distribution is still gonna be close to a unimodal distribution. But if a mountain, you know, starts getting high, mm. you know, like, yeah. then you're far. Okay. And it really depends on the, your choice of distance, uh, whether it's this problem is interesting to you or not. Right. So you you mm -hmm. as a uh, scientists uh, have a class of uh, hypotheses about uh, phenomenon. You're observing samples from the phenomenon, and you want to decide, you know, is my theory correct that, I don't know, this phenomenon behaves in this kind of way, or all the models in the class that I'm allowing are far from explaining what's happening. So this is a well-studied problem, of course. This is basically, uh, you know, in the heart of science, right? So we make hypotheses and want to test them from samples. And there's a, you know, a ton of work in statistics uh, giving tests to test various hypotheses. Uh, in comparison to this work, uh, our work is different. So let me clarify a bit what is the focus of attention in this work in statistics. So statisticians are interested in these two quantities. This is the probability of missed detection, right? This is taking the supremum over all models in the class, all right? And asking the question of what's the probability that your test says zero, says no, while, you know, your distribution is in the class. So that's the probability that you missed a model that's actually in your class. But this is the probability of false alarm. And I'm taking the supremum over all distributions that are absent from your models. And I'm asking, what's the probability your test is going to say that actually it is in the class, right? So this is, this is you know, type 1 and type 2 error. Okay? So these are the quantities of interest in statistics. And uh, the focus has been on asymptotic consistency. All right? So as um, the number of samples go to infinity, you're interested in making both pr these probabilities zero and using CLT or large deviation analysis, you can also track, uh, I don't know, like try to understand the rate of convergence uh, of these probabilities to zero. Okay? Uh, in comparison to this work, we're not going to take the number of samples go to infinity. So our approach is that we want to understand the non-asymptotic regime. We want to minimize the number of samples that we need to <coughs> answer the question that are, you know, to decide between P in the class and P far from the class as a function of epsilon and the type, you know, the, 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 the class C. And we want to minimize the number of samples and be computationally efficient and we also want a tight control of, of, all, of, of both types of error, type 1 and type 2. And uh, focusing on the non-asymptotic regime has been uh, of interest to theoretical computer science recently, sublinear algorithms and property testing as well as information theory. Cool. So, uh, let me be more formal about the model. So the problem is parameterized by a class of distribution C, say unimodal distributions. And these distributions are supported over some domain X. All right. For me, in this talk, I'm going to think about a discrete domain. And, uh, you know, often it's just going to be numbers 1 through n. Okay. Uh, in particular, notice that this class of distributions is non-parametric. It's not sort of like, uh, I don't know, I'm not sort of like, a, a class that would be parametric would be to say, C is all Gaussians, right? So now there are two parameters defining all members in this class. For the problems I'm going to be interested in, uh, a C is going to be non-parametric. So I'm going to say, I'm going to be interested in Cs that are all monotone distributions or all unimodal and so on and so forth, right? So this is a, you know, your, my problem is going to be parameterized by a class of distributions. My input is going to be sample access to some unknown distribution P over this domain and some epsilon, some accuracy I'm interested in. And I want to distinguish, by getting a bunch of samples from P, I want to distinguish whether my P is in the class or it's far from the class. And in today's talk, I'm going to choose the distance to be the total variation distance. 
So the L1 distance between distributions. Okay, so the distance of a distribution from the class is, I look at all distributions in the class and find the closest one in total variation distance. Uh, is, uh, are you guys familiar with total variation distance? <coughs> uh, so there are a bunch of these interpretations of what it is, but a good one is, uh, um, I look, so the total variation distance between two distributions is, I look at all possible events and ask the question, what's the difference in probabilities assigned by one or the other distribution on this particular event? And I take the supreme over all events. In any event, so this is the variation distance. And again, my goal is to minimize number of samples and be computationally efficient. So this is the formal definition of my problem. Yeah? Cool. So let's look at some warm-up examples. So maybe the most sort of like basic testing problem is to test the bias of a coin, okay? So suppose you have access to a coin, okay? So you have a coin, a euro, right? And uh, that has some unknown bias B. And what you want to test is, is this euro an unbiased coin? So the probability of heads is one half. Or is it epsilon far from one half? Okay, is it biased more than epsilon away from one half? That's your, that's your goal. Okay. Do we know that how many samples from a coin I need to draw to tell if it's a half or far from a half by at least epsilon? It's a good question. So it's a function of epsilon, right? Yeah. What's the function of epsilon? Log one by epsilon. Log 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 do you, do you understand the question? <laughs> 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 so, okay, so they don't say log 1 over epsilon. All right, so uh, actually the answer is 1 over epsilon squared, which is tight. Which, and much which is ridiculously worse than. Which is much worse than log 1 over epsilon. And I thought it's instructive to just go through the calculus to, to see why it's log 1 over it's, uh, <laughs> it's 1 over epsilon squared. Because I, okay. I, 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 thought, I thought the same, right? Do you remember our discussion? Uh, I, th I thought with the Chernobyl bound you'll get, uh, you'll get, but he argues the opposite, so right. we've been confused about this. So let's, let's look at it, okay? Uh, okay, so then again, what is my goal specifically? I want to toss the coin several times, and I want to tell if this is the case or that is the case with probability at least, say, 99%, where the probability is over my coin flips, okay? Right, so one approach to answer this question is to try to estimate the bias of the coin, okay? So how do you estimate the bias of the coin? You flip a bunch of times, you average the results, right? So this is your estimator of the bias. Now, by turn of bounds, you actually do it correctly, uh, if k is at least 1 over epsilon squared, the distance of your estimator to the truth is at most epsilon over 3. Okay, now if you have an accurate estimate of the real bias that is accurate to within epsilon over 3, you can distinguish between this or that, right? Because, uh, I don't know, you need 3 epsilons over 3 to get epsilon, right? So you, can, you have a good, you can distinguish these two cases. Does it make sense, this calculation? So I guess uh, your turn of, you, you should do the turn of bound correctly. So you, the, the, you really need one over epsilon squared samples to get to estimate a quantity that is in zero one to within epsilon additive. Right? I mean, I guess- I'm surprised I guess by that. I'm thinking of Sanoff's theorem, and that's yeah. telling me that basically if I want a coin to look like P plus epsilon instead of P, I need two to the minus n, which is my number of flips, is basically going to be two to the minus n, well, the exact expression is the KL divergence of p in p plus epsilon. What he's saying is the chance that you confuse a binomial uh, with actually any two, any two distributions is the chance to confuse them is, if you see n triads, is two okay. to the minus n Kullback Leibler of the distribution. Okay. So you're getting exponential. I'll get, I'll get to that. Okay, so. What so am I missing here? Right, okay, so let, 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 right, you're sorry. so let me get into this. So actually, you're right to complain because I only showed you an upper bound, okay? So I applied turn of bounds to tell you that this estimator gets the truth to within epsilon over three with at least one over, k, one over epsilon squared sum. I, I, I would expect this is just This is just an upper bound. 
Okay, but, but I would expect log 1 over epsilon there, not 1 over epsilon squared, which is which is huge difference. I haven't shown you a lower bound, right? So okay. this is just, uh, okay. I can do it with 1 over epsilon squared we samples, we don't disagree yet, correct? No, no problem. Yes, right? So I'm just wasteful, right? Fine. I'm wasteful. And to try to, you know, when I did the calculation last night, I got 1 over epsilon squared, okay? <laughs> and then now let me argue that actually it's, it's, uh, it's, it's necessary. Okay, so now the lower bound is the problem. Uh, the lower bound is the interesting part, right? So suppose... Okay, so the question is, okay, are these many samples necessary to tell yeah. this versus that, okay? Yeah. So, so suppose that you have a test that uses K samples. Cool, yes? Suppose you have a test that uses K samples. Then this test can distinguish between two random variables. I take KID samples from a Bernoulli one-half, and I stack them in a vector and call this x, mm -hmm. and I give you one sample from x. Okay? Then I get k iid samples from a Bernoulli that's 0.5 plus epsilon, yeah, yeah. stack them in the vector, give you one sample You're from that the sum vector. Is that's it's not just even the sum, I just look at the vector. Yeah, sum is statistic, yeah. sum is sufficient, Perfect. but uh, fine. Perfect. Okay, I stack them in the vector. So if your test works with k samples, then it should be able to distinguish one sample from x from one sample from y with probability at least 0.99. Yes? Claim any tester has error probability at least half times one minus the variation distance between the distributions. Obviously, you can trivially get a tester that has probability of success a half, right? Random guess, right? What this is telling you is that as the total variation distance between these two random variables gets closer and closer, you convert to a half. And this is tied. Okay. The best at least, at least or at most? The probability oh, of error. error, error probability. Okay. The error probability is at least right. half right, plus uh, times this. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. The closest these guys get, the closer your error probability goes to zero to one half. Okay? Right. Now the question now boils down to what's the total variation distance between a vector of Bernoulli IID one half Bernoulli's? versus a vector of IID half plus epsilon Bernoulli's, correct? That's the, that's the pertinent question. How close is this guy from this guy? Yeah? So it turns out that if you do the calculation, and here's the right way to do it, okay? So there are many ways to do it. You can use, I don't know, large deviation analysis or whatever. But the right way to get the bound is the following. The variation distance is related to what is called the Hellinger distance. Okay. Now the Hellinger distance is a good distance because it has like, you know, in some sense this is a product distribution of Bernoulli's a half. This is a product distribution of Bernoulli's half plus epsilon. It's hard to relate the variation distance between uh, two product distributions. You can get a bound, but it's not tight. To relate the, the total variation distance between two product distributions to the underlying variation distances of the, its coordinate, right? So uh, you can get a bound, but it's not tight. The, 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 a way to get a tight bound is to bound total variation distance by Hellinger distance. Now this distance gives you a much tighter connection between uh, the, the Hellinger distance between these product distributions and the underlying components. And if you do the, cal the calculations, you actually get that the variation distance between these two vectors is at most epsilon squared k. So unless k becomes at least 1 over epsilon squared, this variation distance is too tiny to allow you to depart from a half significantly. Yes? How does a sample vary with the error probability in detection? How is it related to point zero one? Sorry, again? How is it, like, like what is the relation with 0.01. So omega 1 by epsilon square sample is necessary to accurately distinguish with probability 0.99. So I want my probability of error to be yeah. 0 0.01. Yeah. So, so this should be smaller than 0 0.001. So no, no, my question is 0 0.01, whatever that quantity delta, let's say, that was a feature in your number of samples. So that's log 1 Oh, if you want to boost this, you're asking? Yeah. It's a log 1 over delta. So your okay. So the term of bound intuition is correct as far as this probability is concerned. Yes. So as far as boosting the probability of missed it, like bad detection, you pay log one over delta. But as far as the uh, decision boundary is concerned, 
you pay one over epsilon squared, and this is the calculation that actually uh, shows you. Can clarify what the hell is going on? Because, sorry, say that again, because I'm, I'm right. still shocked. All right, so there are two, two parameters I'm actually. Inside. Right, right. Yeah. So there are two parameters, and I'm hiding one of the two parameters, okay? <laughs> so one parameter is the decision boundary, huh? like uh, 0.5 versus 0.5 plus epsilon. That's the, the how, you know, how close the gap, the right. gap between right. the two right. Bernoulli's. Right. The other is that I'm hiding, because I didn't want to get into having two parameters, is what's the, the probability of good detection I'm asking for? Right. right? And, I, and I put a constant here. Fine. Right? Now, one question is, if you want this constant to be 1 minus delta, where delta is some parameter, yeah. how does that affect the number of samples? And the answer is that you just multiply this by log 1 over delta. So if you're looking for a log, it happens there. It's in the probability of good detection. OK, I see. But I see. when it comes to the distinguishing boundary, yeah. you really need 1 over epsilon squared. So, so let me try to say what he's saying and tell me if I'm correct. Yeah. So what he's saying, I think, is he's saying if you, want the, if you have a constant gap between the biases yes. and you want the probability to be a small, yes. you, you get expon you're making the probability yes. exponentially small. Okay? Yes. So if you want the probability to be small, let's say delta, then yes. you need log 1 over delta. That's Correct. what we all learn in kindergarten. Okay? Great. So now what he's saying is in the distance between the biases, Yes. You are screwed. Okay? Yes. So if the distance exactly. between the biases is approaching zero, then you need. Okay, fine. Yeah. All okay. Okay. Everybody. Okay. Perfect. Cool. Yes. Yes. Right. So that's the, my first warm yeah. example. It's just, it's just that usually everyone in this room yes. <laughs> assumes that the distance between two distributions is always a constant. So we never have to distinguish between two distributions where a devil is 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 pushing the biases incredibly close. So we never talk about this as epsilon. It's always a probability of error than epsilon. Okay. okay. Cool. We're good. All right. Yes. All right. Cool. I was I was crying inside. <laughs> the last ten minutes. <laughs> All right. So another, the, like cute example is uh, uh, lotteries, right? So when we play the lottery, we want uh, that uh, the lottery outputs, you know, random numbers. So this particular lottery actually outputs twenty numbers in a range of one through eighty. Okay, so here are the, for example, the 20 numbers that it output in a particular uh, outcome, all right? Uh, uh, and, you know, and you hope that, you know, if you play in the lottery, you hope it's a uh, 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 uniform distribution that's sampling the numbers. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the question is, is it really uniform? Is it really uniform, right? Because otherwise I wouldn't want to play in, the, in this lottery. And that's a question of testing uniformity of distribution. That's, that's a more complex problem, right? So before I was testing the bias of a coin, now I have a, a distribution that's purportedly um, samples uniformly from a range, and I want to decide, is it uniform or far from uniform? Uh, so now, if, you know, it's so like uh, my colleague uh, Ronit Rubinfeld actually uh, plotted this graph. Actually, in fact, Eric Price plotted this graph. But uh, it's, uh, you know. It appears in a talk by my, my colleague Ronit Rubenfeld. They were scam, right? They, they, they made some money, didn't they? Some MIT students. Uh, right? I don't know, actually. Yeah, you yeah. Know? I think Eric was. I don't know. The, I, don't know the I think they discovered it. <laughs> anyway, I just uh, But, you know, so this picture, so here's what's happening here. So I'm, uh, I'm looking at 300 outcomes of the Polish lottery, okay? Each of them draws 20 numbers. So basically, I have supposedly. Uh, 6,000 draws from a purportedly uniform distribution in 1 through 80. The expectation for this number is about 75 or something, right? Uh, but you see that the numbers in this range are actually much lower. And the question is, I mean, that we're trying to answer in this talk and uh, previous work is, okay, if I look at this graph, right, should I say, should I, should I, should I, uh, you know, should my interpretation be that actually this is not a uniform distribution or not? Does this number of samples suffice? How many samples and uh, what kind of gap here do I need to be able to, you know, with confidence say this is not a good lottery versus it is, right? Okay, so this looks pretty bad, but the question is, that we're trying to answer is, how many samples you need to draw to actually be able to answer such questions? You know, very dumb question. In, in, in the setting like this, isn't the question of independent building samples also something to be tested for? Or 
Yeah, so I want to test if a distribution is uniform. And if it is, I mean, uh, and oh, yeah, that's right. Yes, okay, fine. Yes. No, but he assumes he gets in the. Yeah, so, yeah, but I'm going to get, that, that's, you're right, and I'm going to, I can, I'll get into independence as well in, in, in later in this talk, but, but you're right. So, there are, in fact, there are two questions, and uh, again, I'm hiring one. One is, is every sample independent? And then is it uniform, right? So there are two questions, in fact. But yeah. you're saying, assuming they're independent, assuming they're independent, it still doesn't look uniform. It still look, doesn't look uniform. Yeah. Okay. So what is the what is the previous work on uh, you know the underlying problem I'm trying to, to st study here? Because these were just two two cute examples. So most of the most of the previous work has focused on uh, identity, what is called identity testing in property testing, and what is called goodness of fit in uh, statistics. What is that problem? The problem is where my class of distribution is just a singleton. There's just one hypothesis, Q. And my goal is to distinguish whether the distribution that I'm sampling, P, is equal to the hypothesis, or it's far from the hypothesis. That's like the testing, the, these previous two examples were exactly of this form, right? So in one case, my Q was an uh, unbiased coin, and I want to see if my coin was unbiased or far from being unbiased. In the second case, you know, I had a uniform distribution as Q, and I want to see if the police lottery was uniform or far from being uniform, right? So this, this was exactly this problem, and that had a singleton set here. So for this problem, uh, sort of like uh, in some sense classical, by now classical work uh, in the field showed that uh, as far as the support size is concerned, you have to pay about the root x to solve this problem, which is interesting because it's sublinear. You don't have to pay the support size, right? So you don't even have to wait in principle. Like if, you, if you're trying to test you know, the uniform distribution over a domain of size a billion, you don't even have to wait to see all the sample, all, all the all the things in the support to, to tell whether it's uniform or not. So that's an interesting fact. Yeah, I guess you're testing birthday paradoxes, right? And yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give some intuition. So in fact, this is the tight result, right? So if you have a specific distribution Q and you want to test if P equals to Q or far from it, this is the tight number of samples you need, right? Interestingly, it still has this epsilon squared. I mean, you cannot avoid it even for a coin. But the dependence on the support size is root the support size. Now what's the intuition that I don't even have to wait enough samples as a support size to tell? This is the intuition is basically what Alex is uh, hinting at. And it is that, let's consider the special case where Q is the uniform distribution. Right? Uh, and P is a uniform distribution over a random support of size n over two. So you have Q is uniform over N. P, the unknown distribution, is the following. I pick a random support of size N over 2. And then I have the uniform distribution over that support. Now, first of all, this is to convince you that you need to pay root N samples to distinguish between the two. Because what? Because if you don't wait root N samples, you're not going to see any collision. So there's no way for you to tell anything about whether you're really observing a uniform distribution over, a, over, over this set or a uniform distribution over a smaller set of about the same size, or in, within a factor of two, right? So if you don't wait through 10, you can't s tell anything, okay? Now the surprising fact is that uh, collision statistics suffice for you to tell, okay? So you don't have to pay more than birthday paradox. To, to distinguish between the so two. Of course, I have yeah. a question on this. Uh, I mean, obviously, goodness of fit is something that people have been using for millions of years, right, since dinosaurs were invented. Yeah. So it's not that this problem was started in 2001, right? So, True. So the, the, what do, like, everybody learns to do a Pearson chi-square, right? Yes, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that, but it does... How does it compare to this stuff? It, 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 is, it is bad. Uh, Pearson doesn't work. So it, it's going to get really bad dependence. It's going to pay actually linear dependence in terms so of. So why, why then isn't everybody using this? It's they should. It's been 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, so this is a huge thing. Right? I'm going to get to that, but Pearson's chi square test, which is the standard way to, t to do goodness of fit, is actually going to pay linear in the support size. Uh, and I'll. I'll, I'll there must be a trade off. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. So I'll tell you why. In a, in you know, what I, what's going on in my head is 
either like the whole scientific community who decided every drug everyone ever takes is an idiot who have ignored a huge breakthrough to save millions of lives for 15 years, or there is a trade-off that we're missing, right? Uh, yeah, I, I don't see the trade-off. I mean, I don't see a way, yeah. Okay, but do you, do you understand? Yeah. So you're assuming you discrete distribution. What about continuous? Uh, I, 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 I can get into that in the end. Uh, for continuous total variation distance is not the right uh, notion of distance, but uh, you can extend these results to work for earth mover distance, which is the, a more natural distance for continuous. All right. So I, I, again, so uh, in some sense, testing identity to a specific distribution is a, a well understood problem by now. Okay. I mean, I already talked about uh, what statisticians focus on, right? Which is the infinite. Uh, no, but it's not an uh, infinite. It is not an infinite discussion. Tell me, you have a test yes. that will. I mean, when I'm giving, when I'm doing a drug test, I have these poor people and I'm killing them, right? I'm giving them water right. to, uh, to to test if a drug works. Yes. Right? So there's people who die because there is like. Yes, there, I mean. Okay? So so if if there is a and I mean, it's not an infinite thing. It's like right. there's like twenty patients. Uh, yes. So yeah. So the, if, if these people could get statistical strength by, by killing fewer people, Right. They better should be doing it, right? Yes, I mean, uh, so I'm uh, missing, yes. right. So I'm going to make a bold statement that we need. I mean, it's unclear to me what uh, statistical testing statistics mean for finite sample regime. I'm going to make a bold statement. Mm. I'm also going to point you to that classical paper why most published medical research know, is false. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, of course. And we can. It's a more philosophical sort of discussion yeah. to have. But I'm going to specifically for Pearson's test. I'm going to get to in a bit. So in any event, so as far as testing against a specific distribution, we, we understand by now exactly, in, at least in this regime of finite number of samples and this type of decision boundary, uh, we understand the answer to this question. Uh, but as far as, uh, but this is very restrictive, right? Because chances are you're not going to have the hypothesis exactly, right? Like in, in, a, in, a, in a scientific experiment, maybe you know, sort of like we expect, you want to test if you know, a distribution is Gaussian, you're going to try to estimate the mean and variance of that Gaussian, but of course you're not going to have these parameters exactly. So this, the previous test does not apply because it requires you to test exactly equal to distribution or far from it. Chances are you're not going to know this distribution exactly in practice. So you need to, ex you know, to extend the problem to a richer classes C. And uh, uh, today I'm going to try to test the following properties of distributions. I want to test if a distribution is monotone, meaning the density is increasing in the, in the domain. I want to test unimodality, so you have one mode. I want to test log concavity, which is this definition in the discrete world. So that at every i, pi squared is bigger than the product of uh, i minus 1 and i plus 1. I want to test one of those hazard rate, which is a distribution that, uh, I don't know, uh, is uh, uh, the type of distributions that are uh, well used in survival analysis and economics. This is the definition, that for every i, if I look at this ratio, the, the, the probability at i versus what's coming after, that's increasing in i. Or you can think about it as that the log 1 minus the CDF is concave for intuition. And the prior art for this problem is that, at least in the finite sample regime I'm considering, is that only monotonicity studied and the results are, are suboptimal. Okay? Let me tell you what we know about monotonicity. So suppose you have, first of all, what is monotone? What is a monotone distribution in uh, high dimensions? Uh, that whenever a point X dominates in all coordinates a point Y, you know, want the, dis the, the density to be higher at that point. So, for this problem, uh, for one dimension, the best prior result is uh, root n over epsilon to 3.5. For d dimensions, it's the dimension minus a half. So you can think about it as all the prior results are paying exponentially in the dimension minus a half. So what are our results? Can uh, you be exponential in the dimension? Uh, yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to tell you what exactly you need to be. Wow. Okay. So our results are the following. So we have optimal testing algorithms for identity, monotonicity, log concavity, MHR, and unimodality. And the number of samples is the same as identity testing. Nothing changes if you make the distributions richer, the classes richer. 
in, uh, if you want to do monotonic tests in d dimensions, this is the exactly right complexity you need to pay in the dimension, it's d over 2. Oh, instead of d minus a half. And we also pin down the exact, uh, like, non log factors, like an exact dependence on epsilon. If you want to test if a distribution over uh, uh, the discrete hypercube <coughs> in d dimensions is a product distribution versus being far from all product distributions, the right complexity is exactly this, n to the d over 2. Right? So you pay exponentially the dimension, but half of it. That's the tight bound. And we have matching lower bounds for all of these problems. Right? And what I like about our results is that if you look at prior work, there are a lot, in this, at least in this literature, there are a lot of different tests for each specific problem. In this work, we have one tester that actually solves all the problems. So we, it's a unified approach that actually has optimal testers for all, the, all, all these problems. Okay? So it's the same test? That There's one test that solves all these problems. Okay? But there are bells and whistles, right, for, for its case. And I'll tell you wh what the test is. Okay, so what is the approach to actually test against the family of distributions? And I'm going to uh, be a bit faster now because uh, I'm approaching the end of the <laughs> <laughs> um, So here's, here's, a natural, here's a natural approach for uh, testing a distribution. Right? So again, this is my goal. Given sample access to P, I want to see if P is in the set of distributions or far from it. Uh, the natural thing to try is to do a learning followed by testing approach, right? So what, what do I mean by that? Well, in the beginning you get a bunch of samples from P and you try to learn, you know, some Q in your class that should be close to P if P is really in the class. Okay, so you want to, f by p getting a bunch of samples from P, you want to learn some hypothesis in the class of hypothesis you allow, such that if P is in the class, then they're close. Okay, what you learned is very, very close to the, the, you know, the unknown distribution. And uh, on the other hand, if it's far from the class, P is far from the class, you need that what you learned is also far from your distribution. And in fact, that's automatic, because if you learn a Q in the class, and this is true, then because this is true, this is implied, right? So. Uh, to summarize, you have this unknown P, you get a bunch of samples from it, and say, look, if P is in my class, here is a good hypothesis for, for what it is. Okay, Q. Right, so this is what I'm doing in this step. And now, I have a specific hypothesis Q, and I want to test whether P is, in the Q, is that Q, or it's far from it. Right, so I reduce, I reduce this decision, this distinguishing uh, problem, to this distinguishing problem after I have learned this candidate Q. But in fact, it's kind of like a weird uh, decision problem which is called tolerant identity testing, a bit different than the identity testing problem I mentioned before. And it's because I have some slack. Right? So P is not necessarily exactly Q if it is in my class, but it's close to Q. Right? So in fact, this is what I want to test. Right? Given sample access to P and an explicit description of Q, I want to know, are they close within epsilon over 2 or further on epsilon in variation distance? All right, so I want to first learn the hypothesis Q that's close to my P if P is in my class, then test if P is really close to Q or not. So that's a natural thing to try. Because, in fact, you know, basically the only testers we have are basically identity testers, right? So I want to do some chi-score tests, some, some, some tests like that in the end, right? But to do this test, I need the hypo a specific hypothesis, not a class of hypotheses. So what I do is I learn first a hypothesis that should be good, and then I test if P is really close to that hypothesis or far from it. Unfortunately, when you partition this problem into these two parts, it turns out that uh, you already overshoot in the number of samples because this problem, the tolerant identity testing problem, is actually much harder than the identity testing problem. For the identity testing problem, where this was a zero, uh, we were playing root the support size. Turns out that once you want to have this type of distinguishing problem, 
you have to pay almost linearly in the support size. Right? So, not collisions, birthday paradox, etc., do not work for this problem. Right? So, this approach actually is not fine as is, right? One thing, thing you may try to do is to say, look, I mean, okay, why does this need to be epsilon over 2? Maybe it should be epsilon squared over 2. Maybe I should invest a little bit, a little more samples to get a tighter and tighter and tighter hypothesis to make this problem easier. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, this trade-off doesn't actually lead to a good uh, overall algorithm, testing algorithm. I cannot beat the paying linearly in the support size for the overall algorithm if I do this approach. Okay. So the heart of our uh, work is a new type of testing problem which we call chi-squared chi L1 testing problem. And it's the following. First of all, what is the chi-squared divergence? Sorry, there's one more definition. So if I have two distributions over some uh, domain x, the chi-squared distance is basically the L2 squared distance, except it's scaled by in a, in a weird way. Okay, this is the chi-squared distance. If you don't like chi-squared, think of this as the second order Taylor expansion of KL divergence. Okay, so the second order expansion of KL is this. Right, so this is chi-squared distance. Now if you do Cauchy's parts, it actually is a stronger distance than L1 distance. Okay, so chi-squared upper bounds total variation distance squared, L1 distance squared. As the school back line. Right. And uh, in fact, so that what it means this in particular is that if chi-squared between two distributions is small, then total variation distance is small. And if L1 is big, then chi-squared is big. Okay. Now, what we propose in this work is the following type of testing problem. It's a tolerant identity testing problem, except we change this from L1 to chi-squared. Okay, so what we say is that here is, here is a testing problem. Given Q explicitly, and sample access to P, and some epsilon, your goal is to distinguish whether the chi-squared between P and Q is small, versus the L1 between these two distributions being far. Okay, so we mix and match different distances. Okay, so if, this, th if they're close in chi-squared, they're also close in L1, right? but this is a tighter way in which they're close, if this is true. Right? What we show is that to solve this problem, even though it's a tolerant identity testing problem, having changed this from L1 to chi-squared actually brings down the complexity again to root the support size. Okay. Um, so in particular, going back to my learning followed by testing approach that I had before, I want to change a few lines of my algorithm here. I want to change this to a better learning algorithm. So it's, if P is in the class, I want to learn a Q that's not only is close in L1, but actually it's close in chi-squared. I need to have a stronger requirement. So I need a learner in chi-squared now. And now, once I do this, my distinguishing problem is this, right? So distinguish chi-squared close versus L1 far. And at least this step now has the right complexity, because as I said in the previous slide, we can do this with root the support size samples. And the question is, you know, am I screwed in this step now? Because I'm requiring something much better. I'm, I don't want to learn a hypothesis that L1 close, but I want to learn a hypothesis that's chi-squared close, which is a tighter distance. Right? The question is, is this a good trade-off to introduce? Like, is, is it good to actually move away from L1 in this step to gain in, in the testing problem over here? Okay, it turns out to be true. So in connection to your previous comment where you were saying, let's just improve that epsilon, let's just reduce that epsilon, you're doing something different here. So it means yeah. there's not another... No, as so far as I can tell. Not the bound on the other side as well. I, I don't know how to yeah, reduce stain L1 and reduce this to something smaller and make this work. It's interesting because for a lot of concentration inequalities, going from KL divergence, which is more demanding than this, to an upper bound by total variation, mm -hmm. which is whatever it's Pinsker or something like that, is basically enough to get you tight concentration or very strong concentration inequalities. 
but here obviously it's... Uh, it turns out that for this problem, this was the bottleneck before with L1. It turns out that uh, rescaling the uh, distance with QI at the denominator is actually makes the problem easier. Okay. Uh, and in fact, I mean, intuitively, you make this an easier problem by requiring... Yeah. Right? If you pay more there, you get more, uh, yes. you get more there. Yeah. Now, let me try to connect to Pearson's chi-square test, okay? And, and make uh, the, the crucial point why I, I believe our version is better. Uh, right, so again, after you do this, the pertinent question is if this step became more expensive. I'm going to come to this uh, in a little bit. But now let me actually show you how to get uh, to solve this problem. Right? Again, this is my, the goal right, for the testing phase of the algorithm. And the way to solve it is to apply a Pearson sky squared type test, except with a twist. Uh, let me try to first uh, do a bunch of things. So first, in testing problems, it's actually useful to do a Poissonization in the beginning. Okay? So instead of drawing M samples from P, I'm actually going to draw Poisson, many, Poisson M many samples from P. The good thing about that is that if I call Ni the number of times the symbol I in my domain appeared in the sample, that's, first of all, a, a Poisson distribution with this mean. But in fact, these and nines are independent, and that's the crucial part. That makes my analysis much easier, okay, later on, okay? And because this is fairly tightly concentrated, when I say Poisson M versus exactly M, that's basically about the same samples within a constant factor. Okay, so, I, right, so everybody with me? Okay, so N i is, you know, in my sample, how many times I saw symbol i? Now, I'm going to formulate this statistic, okay? So, so your, hist your histogram bars are, are independent? My histogram bars are independent, right. yeah. Based on my empirical histogram, I'm going to form this statistic. Ni, the expectation of Ni is MQI. So I'm interested in how far Ni is from what it should be, if QI was a good hypothesis for P, right? This is what it should be if it was close, if it was exactly QI. Uh, squared minus an i, that's the weird part, over mqi. Now, first of all, the way I set up the statistic, if you look at the expectation, you get actually exactly the chi-square distance between what you're sampling and what your target is. If, if you do the math here, right, and take expectation over this, you'll have to have expectation over Poisson minus its mean squared. If you do all that calculation, you get that the expectation of Z is actually M times the number of samples I got, the chi-square distance of what I'm sampling, P, to um, a Q, my hypothesis. All right? Now, if, I'm in this case, the expectation should be smaller than epsilon squared. If I'm in that case, since this is a lower bound on chi-square distance, my expectations should be bigger than epsilon squared. So the expectations are far by a factor of two, okay? So it better be that the variance of this guy is small enough so that I can distinguish the two cases, right? And, you know, computing the variance of this with these independent Poissons here is a bit of a pain, but we did it, okay? And trust me, the variance is good enough to then d d use Chebyshev's inequality and distinguish between the two cases. Okay? But that's, that's the idea of what's happening here. But let me try to compare to Pearson's chi square test. Pearson's chi square test is the same thing, except there is no s this thing is not there. Okay? Of course, without this thing, this is not true. Okay, so the expectation is off. But more importantly, it turns out that subtracting this thing makes this much more concentrated. It may have a huge influence on the variance of this. So subtracting this thing, which is not independent from that, it's actually correlated with that, reduces the variance of this statistic a lot. So much so that it can, it can give you, you can go for like, instead of paying you know, n, you'll pay root n, where n is the support size. So this is really crucial to subtract this thing. And that's the difference with chi-square test, okay? So this is very helpful. It decreases the variance, okay? And it allows us to 
from a few samples to, to actually do it. Cool. Uh, I mean, I guess, sorry, there, there should be some M's here if you look confused. Uh, I mean, there should be some M's because I'm multiplying this by M. So, but up to that, I'm, I'm, I'm correct. Okay. But this, this is a takeaway message, right? So, if you want to do the identity testing and you want to be tolerant, then you want to use, you mean, you know, reduce the number of samples. It's a good idea to do, to, to subtract this. You reduce the variance of the statistic. Cool. So now it all boils down to let me go back to my high level and I only have a few slides so I think five minutes should be fine. So this is my high level approach. The goal is to, to distinguish whether P is in the family or it's far from it. And my goal was to first learn, with it, to, with it, to learn a hypothesis Q that's chi-square close if my distribution is in the family. And this is automatic, right, as I said. And after doing that, uh, you know, apply the chi-squared L1 test from the previous slide to distinguish these two cases. And again, this test only uses root number, root the domain size samples, so this is not the bottleneck anymore. And the pertinent question is how, whether you can solve this line efficiently. Right, so that's, that's the goal now. And let me discuss what goes into doing that for the various families that we are considering this work. Oh, weird. <laughs> what? This, uh, this was weird. Why did that happen? Okay. Uh, imagine that here there is a box that basically is the same as this box. Okay. Which also disappeared. <laughs> oh. This was not what I needed in the last five minutes. <laughs> okay. Let's try this. Oh. Okay. Okay, cool. It's not that I Backtracking works, you know? So, okay. So, all right. So, this is what I want to do. And now I'm considering the class of distributions that are locked in cave. Right? So I want to I wanna do proper learning in chi-squared uh, for log concave distributions. So we show that if you draw 1 over epsilon to the 5 sample from a log concave distribution, you can first of all learn the effective... Sub so the, the, the log concave distribution may have some points of very, 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 very small probability at the tails. So you can actually you can get rid of them. Okay? So you can learn an effective support with reasonable you know, uh, mass okay, uh, on every point. So get rid of that. All right. That's not going to affect anything here. Uh, and uh, you can actually, uh, on, on the remaining support, you can actually implement this with this number of samples. And uh, it takes two things. One is to do density estimation uh, on, on this support. Uh, argue properties of the distribution that it doesn't, uh, that sort of like, Density estimation actually gives you a multiplicative guarantee rather than just an additive guarantee. If you do density estimation, having excluded the support, you can actually you don't not only get additive guarantees on the various probabilities, but actually multiplicative guarantees. And after doing that, you, have, you can set up a convex program to uh, convert this density estimate into an actual log concave density. I'm skipping the details, but uh, the overall Complexity is dominated by, by this step, so you know this is, doesn't depend on the support size. Okay, even though I really don't like this epsilon to the five there, but that, that's what it is. Uh, uh, the but let me do an interlude, right? So what we show is that for all epsilons, and no matter what the support size is, we don't pay anything in the support size. For all epsilons, uh, with one over epsilons to the five samples that does not depend on the support size, we can get a we can learn a long concave distribution properly in chi square distance. Okay. Now, De Vrijen and Lugosi have shown that if you don't want to properly learn, but you only need a density estimate, you need to pay at least one over epsilon to two point five samples. So you cannot get away with fewer than 1 over epsilon to the root of 5, even if you just wanted to do density. You, you didn't need to output a local cave distribution, just a density that's close to your distribution. 
and even in L1 instead of chi-squared that we're doing, okay? Okay, that's an interesting fact too. So this is in the chi-squared. This is in L1. They both do not depend on the support size. One is 1 over epsilon to the 5 because it's doing a better learning. This is uh, uh, a lower bound of 1 over epsilon to the 5. Here's a curious fact from statistics. Okay, this is <laughs> ridiculous, <laughs> but... Oh, it's missing. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay, in any event, so... Uh, <laughs> let me tell you what it was. You can, uh, as the number of samples goes to infinity, you can actually estimate, you can get a density estimate <laughs> distribution whose uh, L1 error decays as 1 over root m, whatever. Right, so, so there is an estimate in statist statistics literature that as the number of samples m goes to infinity, learns a log concave distribution with rate 1 over root m. So now compare this lower bound to this upper bound. So what the heck is going on? Right? So this implies that if I want to learn to within epsilon, I need to pay at most 1 over epsilon squared samples to get that error down to epsilon. This says that if you do not pay 1 over epsilon to 2.5, you cannot learn to within epsilon a log concave distribution. These two statements seem contradictory, but they're actually both correct. And the, the only reason I'm doing this interlude is to actually point out that when you do asymptotic analysis, it's hard to interpret what actually you're getting. Okay? So, this is really a finite versus infinitely many samples problem. And if you look at this paper, what they really mean is that the distribution, the, the order in which this thing decays, actually depends on the distribution P that you're trying to learn. So, it's not truly a 1 over root M rate which you convert. It really depends on your distribution, right? The order. That doesn't seem like finite versus empotic. It seems like. Correct versus incorrect. <laughs> no, they're both correct, right? Except this order hides a P in it. That's important. So this is saying you can learn a specific distribution P? For every P, mm -hmm. I have a tester that decays with this rate. Yeah, yeah. So right? What do you think? Uh, so he's fixing yeah. the right? dependence. Well, this says that for any P, yeah, yeah. this many samples suffice. Yeah. Now you decide which is the right which is the right way to think about it, right? But what I'm pointing out is that the style of analysis in statistics gets this type of results, while what we're doing here in the sample in the final sample is in, we're insisting on results of this form. Right. Okay, so that that's just. Uh, but the right thing to do is put both of the both put all the parameters <laughs> in the thing and see which one is. It depends on your what you're doing, right? So I'm not saying this is wrong or or not, but I'm just giving two results that seem contradictory, and I'm pointing where the you know what is the distinguishing factor, okay? Yeah. And you decide what you want to use, right? In any event, so uh, with this interlude, let me kind of like uh, move forward and say that you know similar things happen for MHR, and again, the bottlenecks lie in the testing step and not in the learning step, right? So here, you know, one, instead of one over epsilon to the five, we pay you know log n over epsilon to the five, uh, and something interesting happens for monotonicity. Um, a classical result in the statistics literature shows that if you have a monotone distribution over support over a domain n, so it has support of size n, you can actually compress it down to support log n without affecting, the vari affecting it in variation distance but more than epsilon. So if whenever you have a distribution that's monotone in a support, you can bucket you can create log n over epsilon buckets and put a flat distribution in every bucket, approximating your, you know, your distribution. We basically generalize this result to d dimensions, showing that even a high dimensional distribution can be compressed, and now the dependence is log n to the d. But if you compress it, now your, uh, in some sense, your support size becomes from n becomes log n. So learning it stops being a bottleneck anymore. And all the bottleneck again lies in the testing step, right? So the reason why this step is not expensive in uh, monotone distributions is that you know you can compress the support size. Now n became log n, so uh, this is sort of like exponentially more expensive than this. 
and again the bottleneck is here and you pay uh, the, what is the support size is n to the d what is root of that is n over d over 2 and that's what we're paying right uh, unimodality is also has an interesting so again this is just to give you the bells and whistles that go together with the testing result right so this doesn't change for any of the applications but uh, what you do here is you know excluding some part of the support uh, compressing the support to learn it uh, more efficiently various bells and whistles one interesting curious uh, fact was for unimodality one way to test if a distribution is unimodal is to guess the mode of the distribution and do a, a monotonicity testing on one side and the other side of the of the guessed mode of the distribution so you can reduce this problem to monotonicity testing except you have to guess this where the mode is and that incurs an extra factor of log n uh, in the in the in the sample complexity because you have to do a union bound over uh, your guess uh, we can get rid of that using an interesting tool that I recommend you guys look up when you know you leave this talk uh, that I actually I have applied several times it has been very useful in killing various factors uh, it's called Kolmogorov's max inequality uh, this is a cool fact that allows you to get rid of uh, factors of log n that you pay in union bounds you know, if the stars align, and, and in our case, uh, the stars align in this problem, and we can get rid of this un factor you pay for the union bounds by using this inequality. I'm not going to get into the details, just the flavor. So in summary, uh, I talked about testing and density estimation in the small sample regime, as opposed to the asymptotic regime, that is more standard statistics. I talked about non testing non-parametric properties of distributions. All my classes were non-parametric. And I was uh, uh, sort of like insisting on a tight control of you know, both type 1 and type 2 error. So I was very strict about what I'm accepting and what I'm uh, rejecting. And I, go, I, I showed you optimal testers for monotonicity, low concavity, unimodality, MHR and independence. And the crucial idea is this chi-squared L1 test that goes around linear lower bounds in the testing complexity if you try to do learning followed by taller testing algorithms. Uh, and then this gives you various byproducts for proper learning of various distributions in chi-squared distance. Uh, going, for, you know, for, you know, as far as future directions are concerned. I've been recently very interested in high-dimensional testing and learning problems. I think by now we have a very good handle on single-dimensional learning and testing. I think uh, uh, solving high-dimensional problems is important. I already show you two examples here, monotonicity and independence. Testing product distributions, testing high-dimensional monotone distributions. The tight sample complexity for these problems was n to the, the support size of each dimension to the d over 2, right, which sounds expensive, right. The question is, under what conditions can you bypass this exponential dependence in the dimension, right. So we need a better understanding of the interplay, and that was the goal of my interlude there, uh, between low sample and asymptotic regime, right, what, what is, where exactly is the truth, what type of chi-square test we should use, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, I think uh, going beyond the worst case regime that I'm considering here is important. Right? So here, uh, I, was very ag I was very agnostic about the alternative. Right? So I was like, either my distribution is in the model, or I'm completely agnostic about what else it could be. Right? So I, I consider, consider all distributions that are epsilon far. I believe, so like reducing all, the, all these epsilon squares and so on and so forth, is possible if you are less agnostic about the alternatives. And that's also a very a fruitful direction to consider. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Any more questions? Uh, so the root end, the outbound, does it depend on the type of distance you are considering? Uh, it depends. So, the, for example, I mean, for, like for lock concavity, like for several of these distributions, L1 and Kolmogorov are basically the same. Like for, for lock concavity, it doesn't really, right? Or, or for uniformity, or identity testing, because Kolmogorov and 
L1 are basically the same within constant factors, but for other problems it certainly does, right? In fact, if you change L1 to L2, things become very, very easy. But L2 is not a good distance for distributions. It's very... You can have distributions that are uniform on two different supports and they have very small L2 distance. So it does depend on the distance. I'm not claiming L1 is the right one. L1 is kind of like a distance that sort of like theoretical computer scientists use because it's related to bounding over all <coughs> possible events. But uh, certainly uh, other distances like KL or Earth Mover are more relevant in some applications.